And uh, today is D Day, June 6, 1944, 79 years ago, while we were in the midst of World War II. Can you imagine? And actually, both sides of this. You're you're on one of the landing craft, and you're and you're going through these horrible seas to th- this enormous mission. Opening scene of private setting. Yeah, yeah, and and how terrifying that must have been. And on the other side, to be in the German bunkers and looking out and seeing every ship in the world out there on on their way in. It just I can't imagine the stress i mean the, on on both sides and of, you're 19 of, years old and you're 19 years old and you know you're going to have a very 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 bad day yeah and in the meantime while that was going on back here in america women had filled the roles of the men who had left their jobs in the mills and everywhere else the assembly lines uh, to go off to fight the war and those women over time became known as rosie the riveters and I can't think of a person who's done more work to make sure that those women have been recognized, first of all, found, identified, and recognized for the work they did back here at home in, in uh, World War II uh, than Ann Montague, who joins us this morning via telephone. Ann, good morning. How are you? Good morning, my dear. How are you this morning? Mm-hmm. Gorgeous day here in Charleston. I don't know what it's like up there, but... Beautiful day. Well, Beautiful day. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful day. And my co-hosts are John Gilstrap and Jonathan Bodwell. They'll also be asking you questions, too. We've had several interviews with you over the years, and you've been kind enough to bring to our attention many of the West Virginia Rosie the Riveters that we've had the pleasure of speaking with. And as each year goes by, unfortunately, there are fewer and fewer of these women who are still with us. Yes, that's right. And for sure, one of the things that um, essentially we have to deal with on our consistent basis it's a is it is a bitter sweet uh project in other words the loving that these women have brought to us of america and of the people we work with and their families has been so great and the knowledge that they've brought to us however you know they they slip away but one of the good good pieces of news is that we're finding that even though most of the Rosies are gone, Rob, the um, the communities are stepping up in a new way, um, not just to memorialize them, but to say what they did and what they wanted uh, us to do was work together. So we're finding communities almost weekly we have a new community that wants to to do something um and essentially not just again to to say these were what the women did but this is what we can do um similar to what the women did because the women pulled together they did highest quality work they did it in a spirit of cooperation and they said, you know, we did it because we can't lose our freedom. And that's that's just as alive today. Though that legacy of the Rosies is just as alive today as it was for the women back then. But, yes, this is D-Day. It's a pretty special day, isn't it? And what is the latest that you have in terms of these Rosie the Riveters that you're finding, recognizing, and communities are celebrating in West Virginia and around the country? Well, we have... Um, we have two or three things going on right now that are really important, I think, to the whole state of West Virginia. And one is that we are repeatedly being um, emulated, if you will. But we'll do a project here in West Virginia, and it'll be picked up someplace else, even in Europe. So that makes us very proud, and we can really say that the people here in West Virginia and the projects that have been done are so important to other people that they're replicating it so we call that the american rosie movement so in essence we are launching and have been launching for a couple of years now despite covid the american rosie movement and that movement means that people are essentially doing uh projects all over the country and in other places uh, again to show that they can work as well together and that two people can work as well together as they did back in in the war times. One thing about um, one D-Day that, that I 
want people to remember is most people, when they think about D-Day, if they know it at all, a lot of young people don't know anymore, is they see the picture of the men going from the landing craft into the water, and they really were cannon fodder. It was it was horrific. And um, the, But if you take that picture and, and put beside it an aerial picture of what it was like there uh, at Normandy, uh, and you see all the ships, all the Goodyear blimps, all the tanks, uh, essentially an incredible, if you will, army, and realize that that's 1944. The women didn't start going into the factories and, and, and other types of jobs until January of uh, 1942. So in essence, in two and a half years, that whole, those ships, tanks, and all of that were built primarily by women uh, across America, and they came together in a massive force, and they never argued that this was not about protest or blaming. It was about doing the job. So I'm, I'm always, uh, when I'm present, I always show the picture of D-Day from the men's perspective, and of course their lives were being taken. Uh, it, it was it was a bloodbath, really. But we won because we were able to come in there and do a, an excellent job with the equipment that was made over two and a half years, primarily by women. I can only imagine the pressure. This is John Gilstrap. I can only imagine the pressure or I don't know, maybe maybe you know a bit of delight in in building the the bombers and the aircraft and and bullets that that the ladies were putting together, with that knowledge that it was in support of their husbands or sons or brothers or yes. you know fathers that, yeah. that were in in war. Do you know where does Rosie the Riveter the phrase come from? Oh, that's a good question. Rosie the Riveter is really, really a bad name, and we've tried everything we know to um, change it, but it, it'll just only change it with education and time. But most of the women were not riveters, and the way that uh, started, and we we have a researcher over in uh, Columbia, Maryland, who was an expert in music of the time, but Rosie the Riveter came from the song Rosie the Riveter. And with that alliteration and, you know, the rhythm, the, um, uh, that's when the uh, different art pieces of art and other um, essentially promo materials that the government put out uh, essentially started labeling Rosie the Riveter. Now, the women themselves, many, many women that, that we inter- have interviewed, it's more than 200 now, uh, did not know the phrase, and they they don't like the phrase because they uh, recognize very quickly that to pull together we have to respect one another, and only about maybe at the very most 15 percent were actually riveters. They were welders. They worked on offices. They broke codes. My mother uh, inspected lenses for binoculars and gun scopes and. Um, periscopes and all that sort of thing. So one of the things we really have to fight is that a lot of the women who did different kinds of jobs don't come forward and haven't come forward because they thought they had to be a riveter, and that's too bad. And the riveters were primarily used for making airplanes, which was important, but it, it wasn't the full story. It is, but it's 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 catchy, and and to those of us yeah. who are a lot, I mean, I'm I'm 54. To those of us a lot younger who know the history of it, Rosie the Riveter, the title sort of encompasses all of the jobs to us, everything that was done. I would agree. All of the amazing things that that the women did to support everything that that was done. I mean, every every aspect of our society, all of a sudden women were thrust into to all sorts of different jobs and they performed yeah. amazingly. And that is sort of what took us into the economy that we have now where, you know, men, women, everybody are doing uh, basically the same jobs, which is wonderful and how no, it should no be. Doubt about it. No doubt about it. The other thing that the women decided, and, you, you know, we, we actually have polled the women over the 15 years 
it will be, it's 15 years this month that I've put double time into this. And so, you know, I've taken it very seriously. And um, the women say that they like to be called Rosies because they want to know that their legacy is carried forward in a positive tone. In other words, not to protest and not to, um, not to blame. So in other words, it is a rosy project. So they love to be called rosies. And those who are not riveters um, essentially get kind of offended by it. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. It is a li- um, there is alliteration, and it's easy to remember, and it's popular and all that. The other side of that, though, is that um, it's become so commercialized that people are not really understanding the full story and the depth of which these women um, felt their contribution was um, essentially giving to freedom, and not just America. You know, one of our very, very, very best partners is the country of the Netherlands. And we've had, uh, we've been first with all kinds of things. And one was to invite allied nations to thank American Roses. And the first was right there in the Eastern Panhandle in Shepherdstown when we had the uh, Belgians come. And that was uh, 2009. And then 2010, we had the British come. But in 2015, um, it was the uh, Netherlands, the Embassy of the Netherlands and the people of the Netherlands who invited us in. We didn't have, like, events for them to to be able to thank Rosie's. They said, we, we want you to come and be our guest. So I think we've had something like 12 different projects now with the people of the Netherlands. And um, I always think that especially important because the people of the Netherlands couldn't fight back. They were occupied. That's different than Britain where, uh, you know, they could fight back. I'm not saying that one is better or, or any, anything similar to that. I'm just saying that it is very important to realize that when people can't fight back, that's a different sort of control and it's got its own personality. So we've learned so much from the people of the Netherlands. As a matter of fact, we just came back May 10th, uh, on May 10th, uh, in the uh, at the Arlington National Park here near the cemetery, right next to the Iwo Jima Memorial, um, is a carolyn that was given to the United States by the people of the Netherlands. And um, we had a very special event there where the princess was there, and we brought in, I think it was 12 youth from West Virginia. And we also had, um, you know, different rosies and that sort of thing. One of the rosies that was there was Gloria McCormick, who's in Charlestown. She has a, a nice story. And, again, she was not a riveter. But um, that's the sort of thing that we are we're really, really proud of that we've get it. We're getting ambassadors and so forth uh, very frequently. And let me jump in here. Ann Montague is our guest here uh, with the Rosie the Riveter movement, as she mentioned on the program 15 years ago this month. She began searching for Rosies to recognize them. John Bodwell, you were about to say something. Well, I mean, I just keep going back to the fact that, I mean, this really is, it was the, the seminal event in women in the workplace. I mean, it, yes. it is the thing that you look back at that says, hey, all these years that women were held back and, and when they got the opportunity, they were amazing and it's moved forward. I mean, it's, it's the Rosie, the Riveters not only changed the world by, by saving us from, from Nazi Germany by being a huge part of it, but by really changing the climate of the world. And that's, I, I mean, I that's agree. an amazing, and, and Rosie, the stapler just doesn't sound as good as Rosie, <laughs> the Riveter. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's got a right. ring to it of power, of strength, I, of, of I success. Agree. I agree. But I can only tell you that, you know, as a researcher, and I'm, I'm both a researcher and a project manager, but uh, basically I have to report that the women themselves haven't come forward because, and, and they sometimes feel offended, um, that um, essentially they did more than rivet. One thing I'm... Um, 
that I do want to say uh, is that I'm extremely, extremely proud of how West Virginians have come together in this, but we do not have enough uh, publicity, enough media coverage. You all have always been really, really receptive to us and, and, you know, allow us to tell us where we are at a given stage. But the important thing here now is that we've done so much in West Virginia that's being replicated around the country and in other places. But people here in West Virginia don't recognize that we are leading a national movement and that this 15 years of work with um, all kinds of projects that can be and then are being replicated that we started here. So we need to be, be sure that our um, our West Virginians and people there in the, the Quad State area are really proud. We've done so much in the Quad State area, but over the state, uh, let me give you an example. Last October, in Glenville, West Virginia. Now, that's not a city. You knew that. <laughs> it's a town. And uh, Gilmer County High School was the first school in America to name a room, or two rooms, actually, one in the middle school, one in the high school for Rosie's. And they took it so seriously. They did a beautiful job. Our guests were uh, people from the Netherlands and uh, the dean of American University's School of Public Affairs and um, Girl Scouts and students, and, and those those people are still, those children especially, are still with us and still doing projects with us. Now, what that has led to is we just put a proposal into uh, Huntington uh, Depart our Board of Education to name uh, an auditorium and a school there, and we're hoping that schoolrooms around the state will essentially name name uh, classrooms or even a section of a library for Rosie's. And I'm just and, about, I'm just about out of time. What would you yeah. like our residents of the Eastern Panhandle to do? Give me a minute or so of your time here. What would you like them to do for well, recognition the here? The most important thing is to realize that some of the problems that we've – our work has been really exceptional, and I'm not just bragging. Um, but what's happening is that – uh, different parts of the state are not coming together. Typically, we don't, um, but different states, different parts of the state should come together, and we should all be saying we want to follow the Rosie the, uh, legacy, which is pull together, do highest quality work, do it in a spirit of cooperation. And if we can show as a state, as a, a essentially a, a population in this United States of America, that in this smaller state of West Virginia with a population no more than Phoenix, Arizona, um, that we've pulled together, then we are really making a, a beautiful statement. And what we have come to you for and, ho and hope you will continue with us is to be a, a spokesperson for just that purpose. How are we going to pull people together? And um, I'm more than open to any ideas that people have and certainly – uh, want uh, to come back on your program as we do different um, Absolutely. Projects. And how can people get in touch with you to relay their information? Uh, telephone is 304-776-4743. Uh, the website is American Rosie, R -O -S -I -E, movement dot org. Our email is team, T-E-A-M, like um, mule team, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, at AmericanRosieMovement.org. And uh, finally, I do want to say, Rob, that, that um, the T Eastern Panhandle, we, I am now disabled and since, 19, um, and since 2016, and I can't travel like I used to. But the Eastern Panhandle uh, reputation was so great when I had to quit driving. So in other words, just because I'm not out there doesn't mean that we don't appreciate what you do and also appreciate the very, very strong understanding that we've gotten from um, almost everybody we've ever approached in the Eastern Panhandle. Now. And on that note, Rosie, I have to stop you for a moment. i got to get to our final uh, minute of the show here. More to come after this. 